Mammals are known as the Earth's dominant group of animals for a very good reason. For millions of years, their evolution has led to a collection of some of the biggest, fiercest, and most recognizable animals around today. Yet even the mightiest modern mammals have surprisingly humble beginnings, whose ancestors only vaguely resembled the giants yet to be. A fantastic example comes from an animal who you would never guess would lead to some of the largest land mammals to ever walk the earth, with a shape and lifestyle as foreign to its descendants as the time it came from. A small, trunked herbivore called Mirotherium. Mirotherium is an early mammal hailing from one of the earliest epochs of the Cenozoic. Being one of the many creatures to usher in the age of mammals just a few million years after the age of dinosaurs ended. There are currently five recognized species of this odd mammal, each bearing barrel-shaped bodies with tusk-like teeth protruding from their jaws. On first impressions, one might think that with its round, sausage-shaped body with squat little legs that Mirotherium was some sort of early pig or hippo. But in actuality, their closest living relatives are, in fact, elephants. As impossible as it may seem from a distance, and while Merotherium itself may not be a direct ancestor, you are, in fact, looking at a very early form of elephant. So how do we get to this from animals like Merotherium? It's a story that begins earlier than you might think, during the age of the dinosaurs. During the Cretaceous period, the ancestors of modern mammals were experiencing a boom in diversity within the shadow of the dinosaurs' reign, fueled by the shifting and breaking of continents beneath their feet. Some were able to migrate to pastures new, others became more isolated, left to their own devices as continents continued to split apart. One particular group of placental mammals would rise in the growing isolation of Africa from the neighboring continents, a lineage fittingly called the Afrotheres. And when the Cretaceous period came to a close at the collision of an asteroid strike, these ancestral Afrotheres were primed to take the places left open by the now extinct non-avian dinosaurs, most especially the lineage known as the Proboscideans with Mirotherium being one of the very earliest of these forms. Dwelling during the late Eocene, 37 to 35 million years ago, where these unique herbivores were contained in North Africa. Already, the Proboscideans were growing to large body sizes during these early millennia of the Age of Mammals. The meek, pig-like Mirotherium was about the size of a pig on average, but some species were able to reach half a ton in weight, while the neighboring Baritherium, the largest proboscidean of the time, could reach a whopping two tons. A mere fraction of the size of their modern cousins, perhaps, but still amongst the largest land animals around at that time. While not a direct ancestor to modern elephants, Mirotherium was already developing the key characteristic traits that could still be found in elephants today, including early versions of their teeth, with large, downward-curving fangs that were already taking a tusk-like shape, combined with a just-as-primitive version of the compact lophodont molars found in modern elephants used for grinding up plants. Amongst these early elephantine traits, however, was a distinct structure on the skull. A shallow groove just above the upper jaw, fused to the nasal bones. One that held a muscular, flexible structure. That's right, you're looking at what could have been one of the earliest stepping stones towards the evolution of a trunk. Proboscidea's most iconic traits are their long, flexible trunks so characteristic that the group derives its name from the word proboscis, or long elongated nose. So it's ironic that the most controversial aspect of Mirotherium's anatomy is the presence of a trunk at all. 
As a proboscidean, it's often assumed that Merotherium possessed a trunk similar to its later relatives, traditionally reconstructed with a face bearing a stumpy but flexible trunk. But recent years have called this into question, with re-evaluations of Merotherium's skull anatomy showing little evidence for a proper trunk, at least as extensive as those of other known proboscideans. On top of that, its low slung body straddled the ground, too short to feed on the leaves and fruits of tall trees, and its short legs already put it close to terrestrial ground level vegetation. But perhaps, Merotherium wasn't feeding all that much on terrestrial vegetation. After all, Merotherium was actually amphibious, an animal that was just as happy living in water as it was on land. In fact, probably happier. The name Merotherium means Beast of Merus Lake, fitting for a mammal with such a high affinity for water. Merotherium was amongst the most specialized of the early elephant ancestors for an amphibious lifestyle, converging on several anatomical traits with manatees and hippos such as its barrel-shaped ribcage, torpedo-shaped body, and notably small hips and reduced hind limbs that are characteristic of semi-aquatic mammals. What's more, the fossils of this genus are often found in sites whose sediments and materials are often associated with past marine and fluvial environments, all indicative of an animal perfectly adapted for a life in the water. And that has been the consensus for many decades. Harder evidence came in the form of a study in 2008 which ran the isotope analyses of Merotherium and Baritherium in order to discover their habitat and dietary preferences. From the results of the analysis, they found that both elephant ancestors had a diet consisting heavily of water and shore-growing plants, confirming that these animals were spending much of their time foraging in the water, preferring rivers, swamps, and mangroves over more marine saltwater habitats on the coast. Preference being the key word here, as we have found Merotherium remains in deposits associated with estuarine and lagoon habitats, so they did at least venture closer to the coast on occasion. So why would Merotherium need a trunk if it was spending so much time underwater? Perhaps another underwater cousin to elephants may be the key to solving this mystery a group of cousins that, unlike Merotherium, are still around today and are far more specialized for marine life. The Cyrenians, aka manatees and dugongs. Yes, while it may surprise you, manatees and dugongs are the closest living relatives to elephants and other proboscideans around today, splitting into their own separate branch some 55 million years ago. Even today, Cyrenians still share the same thick skin, blunt round toes, and lophodon teeth found in their ancestors, including another surprising characteristic, a prehensile upper lip. And just like elephants, Cyrenians use these lips as their main tools to interact with the world, acting as their own sort of pseudo-trunks to hoove up vegetation along the bottoms of lagoons and seabeds flexing their upper lips to grip and pull water plants into their mouths, just like an elephant does when using its trunk to eat grass. What's more, the flexible upper lips of Cyrenians are very sensitive to touch, and can be used to articulate and feel objects similar to a trunk. Given how Merotherium is a fairly basal member on the Proboscidean family tree, and how Cyrenians maintain their own elephant-like traits as they evolved into marine animals, it's not far-fetched to suggest that these traits might be ancestral to a degree, or Merotherian could have evolved its own pseudotrunk independently, as a means of coping with these similar pressures. Merotherium as a whole has been reconstructed in a number of ways over the years, going from a hairy, tapir-like creature to a long-trunked hippo, to a squat, pot-bellied pig with a trunk. These days, the most up-to-date reconstructions of Merotherium adhere to two hypothesized appearances, the more traditional pig-shaped model with a trunk or something far more radical, 
a rotund, elongated Hyrax-looking model, based on Proboscidean's close relation to Hyraxes, and Merotherium's own basal placement on the elephant family tree. What's more, the presence of these trunks, or flexible lips, could have varied between multiple species, similar to modern tapirs who, while being unrelated to Merotherium, possess their own prehensile upper lips and flexible trunks. A trait that varies between different species, with Malayan tapirs having the longest and most dexterous of these trunks, while Brazilian and mountain tapir are often closer to muscular noses and lips. And the same case could have applied to the various different species of Merotherium. With these prehensile upper lips, Merotherium could more easily forage underwater, with a muscular, mobile lip able to pluck and grip slippery aquatic plants as they grazed along the sandy beds of lagoons and rivers. All of these aquatic adaptations weren't just coincidence, but were shaped by the ancient world Merotherium had inherited from the dinosaurs. Merotherium's habitat sat on the edge of what was once a sea called the Tethys, a tropical seaway that once engulfed much of Europe and North Africa, and reaching far enough to connect Asia to the Atlantic. This wasn't a new seascape, but a relic from the time of the dinosaurs, one that became the cradle of evolution for many types of mammals, from ancient whales to early dugongs, and of course, the earliest ancestors of the elephant, can all trace their family trees back to what was once the coast of the Tethys. On the shores of the Tethys Sea were vast tropical landscapes, filled with endless rainforests and swamps due to the Eocene's warm, humid climate. Here, Merotherium and other elephant ancestors would thrive, animals that were perfectly adapted to survive in the shifting tides of this water world. Even today, elephants remain very proficient swimmers and retain their high affinity for water to swim, play, and cool down in intense heat. So much so that it's even been speculated that Asian elephants migrated from India to Sri Lanka during the Pleistocene via swimming. But just as the Tethys gave rise to the Proboscideans, its disappearance paved the way for their future. As the continents continued to shift into the positions they are today, the Tethys Sea began to close and shrink. A change that coincided with the growing ice caps in the poles, causing the climate to grow cooler and drier, and in a gradual pace, the Tethys would disappear. Even amidst these changes, the Proboscideans would endure, with changes of their own, as they began to evolve to inhabit this drier climate, and disperse across Afro-Eurasia during the Oligocene and Miocene. Their legs would grow more pillar-like to support larger bodies. Their grooves in their molars would grow more wrinkled, transforming into dense, highly replaceable batteries of teeth to grind through tough grasses and dry vegetation of the newly emerging grassland ecosystems. Flexible upper lips fused with their noses into dexterous trunks that would work in tandem with developing tusks as tools for foraging and weapons for combat. Many of these evolving proboscideans would inherit the downward curving fangs like those of Merotherium, and as they lengthened, each new genus and species began experimenting with different combinations of fangs, spears, and shovels that would evolve into pairs of elegant, curved tusks. The result of over 30 million years of evolution would lead to some of the largest, smartest, and diverse groups of mammals to ever walk the earth, whose lineage continues to persist in the form of modern elephants roaming our planet today. Merotheria may not be as big or famous as elephants or mammoths, they've certainly earned a place within the interests of paleontologists and artists, not only for their unique connections to modern elephants, but their own unusual characteristics that set them apart from their modern relatives. A key stepping stone towards some of the most magnificent giants to ever trumpet the earth.